Hello and welcome to today's Partner Web Conference. This is Fast Track Dynamics 365 for Finance and Operations Enterprise Edition Tech Talk. Today's topic, Analytics and Reporting Options, Printing and the Document Routing Agent. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Senior R&D Solution Architect, Eric Pegors. So without any further delay, Eric, over to you. Thank you, Janice. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending. Um, and we will get right into the, the material. Our objectives today are to learn about solution patterns and reporting experiences, uh, and that really means choosing the right tool for the job. And then we'll also talk about how to print documents to an actual printer, a network printer, um, which involves a document routing agent. Um, for the solution patterns, uh, you know, the real-time embedded visuals for um, operational insights leverages Power BI and the analytical workspaces will put together um, embedded visuals like those and more traditional data. And then we'll talk about the data warehouse or data integration solutions, um, the bring your own database and the uh, entity store. And then um, also there's more analytical solutions available via app source. And then for reporting experiences, we'll talk about the chart controls that you see in a lot of demos, SSRS reports, the traditional reports from uh, finance and operations, and financial reporting, which used to be called management reporter, and electronic reporting, which used to be called uh, general electronic reporting, I believe, GER. And like I said, still about, about half of it is about printing in the document routing agent. So we'll start with the solution patterns. And we're talking about a system of intelligence versus a system of integration. So the intelligence on the left involves the uh, entity store, which is the star schema. You know, it's summarized kinds of data that um, you can think of as, or one, one way to think of it is that it doesn't have any vouchers or that kind of detail in simple terms. Um, and on the picture, you can see that the data goes in, the box in the middle is finance and operations, and the data goes into there, that would be through integrations or whatever, and then the Power BI and those things are leverage that data. But I think it's kind of like the smaller data base there is the um, AXDW database. And for the integration on the right, the database is though is your database on your Azure subscription, the bring your own database. Um, it's in the product is called entity export to database. And you can export AX data into that. Um, obviously if it's your database, if it's just coming out of AX, there's little impact on AX. And then it, since it's your database, you can do absolutely whatever you want um, with that database once you have the data in there, including run stored procedures or get stuff from other um, legacy areas, whatever you want. And this slide just talks about those things a little bit. Um, again, for the, on the left, the system of intelligence, the data and intelligence is within finance and operations. And we have tools and frameworks for developers to leverage that stuff. And then there's also ISV solutions available. On the data warehouse system of integration, you extract data out of finance and operations. Um, and then, like, like we said, you can use whatever tools or frameworks you want because it's your database. You have every you know, complete control over it since it's um, a one way out of finance and operations. There's no restriction. And yeah, and then the customer and their partner are free to come up with whatever they want or need on that side. 
Um, a little bit more uh, at a high level here, the uh, coming out of on the system of intelligence, you'll see that that's where the embedded visuals come from, um, which is a part of analytical workspaces and the apps. And then uh, the system of integration is pretty simple. It just centers around that, that database that gets data from AX and other places. And so a lot of the, uh, you know, the data warehouse kinds of stuff in the system of intelligence stuff is, is relatively new. We're used to financial reporting. Um, electronic reporting is maybe a little less, a little less new, but it's still, but it's also, those two are very specific. Um, and the business documents is the SSRS reports, which are uh, things that you want to print to paper and um, typically high volume and then other precision things like checks and stuff. Um, but the uh, data exploration, having charts and views in analytics is a relatively new and it's very powerful. Um, so this is an example of one of those operational views. This is the credit and collections um, workspace from at, uh, Finance and Operations 7.3, just with demo data, but you can see it has the charts and uh, obviously this was created by one of our developers. Um, and it's a combination, like I mentioned before, of the analytical data in the charts and then transaction data for details. And the visuals are typically driven by aggregate data. That's the data without the vouchers and typically coming from the data warehouse. In, uh, you know, in 30 seconds, the, those um, embedded visuals are created by a developer creating an aggregate measurement, and that's the star schema. And then you can use, uh, which is a first class citizen in finance operations development, and so are aggregate data entities. Um, I guess it's worth taking a minute here to say that both of these rely on data entities for, uh, you know, for simplifying the finance and operations schema, which is quite complex, as you all know. And um, there is a difference in that the, um, the data warehouse things are the, are the star schema, so they're more aggregated than the things in the data warehouse, but they do both rely on data entities. And then once you have your aggregate data entity, you can model the chart and put it on a workspace or a form. Um, financial statements with financial reporting is, has been around, you know, it hasn't, um, it's always been here, but um, there have been a, quite a few improvements in the last couple of application releases. Um, you'll see that there's the ability to generate from, from the finance and operations UI now, and there's uh, the view options for the different, um, uh, the different instances of each report, like based on, typically the instances are based on date, like in this example. Uh, so there are more, more things that you can do from the AX client than you used to be able to do. And there's also, of course, still the report designer, which is uh, very powerful. And uh, these slides have links on them. We will give a copy of the slides so that you can click on these links. Um, electronic reporting has also been around a while and it's used for um, predefined electronic format for legal requirements. Um, and it is uh, also covers a lot of scenarios. And then you can also customize things. Uh, a good option for customizing is to s start with one of the out of the box ones that's close to what you need. 
and then you know make sort of make minimal customizations from there but it's completely um, it's completely flexible and again it used to be called GER but it's, it's the same framework and capabilities okay so the entity store is the again is the AXDW database it's included with finance and operations doesn't cost you uh, extra and it is only allowed to um, use aggregate entities those are the summarized ones with the star schema and you can there's some out of the box and you can write your own and there's a uh, if you search in the uh, finance and operations menu search if you search for entity store it'll come up where you can schedule the entities to be exported at, at a regular interval you can set up a recurrence on those and then um, the, the, the main scenario is that you connect Power BI to the database and this is sort of almost sort of an exception where we uh, you're are you are allowed to connect directly to the database there's a procedure for doing that uh, because of the speed and they uh, and because it's it's one way right it's read only but um, so it can be near real time with those updates and um, you know and there this is a area of where we're still improving so you'll see more functionality and over time this is a simple chart that shows how you can um, create your own but you'll work on the uh, a tier one is a is a dev machine so you'll work on the um, entities and things behind the workspace and and create the workspace um, in Power BI, you can create the uh, analytical part. Uh, you do need a Power BI license for that. And then it can be deployed to your tier two and prod. Uh, the other side of the earlier charts were, or uh, slides were uh, the export data to your data warehouse. Um, in the product, this is on the uh, um, it's on the data management workspace, and it's configure entity export to database, and uh, that's where you set up a connection to the database, and then that's your database um, in Azure, and then you can it shows up in the data management for export as an option, just like Excel or CSV. At that point so you can export the entities either the ones the the you know almost like around 2,000 out of the box or custom ones and um, there have also been some improvements in that area of the export uh, the most recent one I think is in platform 12 they um, sort of finally added the delete capability for entity export so you used to have to full push if you were exporting something that had deletes in it you'd have to do a full push once in a while they fix that so um, and again this is also an area of of uh, you know growth sort of so there's more things being added in this area but then once it's in the other the database that you own obviously you can you can do whatever you want to or need to do since it's your database and it's pretty simple to um, sort of keep the data updated from AX okay, so now we'll talk about just a little grid here of the um, reporting tools so we have Excel and you can use Excel with OData to entity any entity you want um, that work uh, it'll work fine um, you know the once the volume gets high then that might be might be a, a factor um, but it's available and then we talked about embedded BI where you have to 
have a developer do it, but then it uses and it uses aggregated data within the product, uh, but it's available to anybody who you give access to that um, form or workspace. Uh, we're all familiar with uh, the SSRS reports, again, created by a developer. You can do um, transactional data, including vouchers or aggregated data. And, uh, you know, the design is pretty much wide open, whatever you can, whatever you can sort of fit on a, on a piece of paper or on a PDF. Power BI we talked a lot about already, um, but it, it's pretty, uh, pretty open and lets you look at the data in different ways uh, quite easily. And that's one of the great strengths of it. And then um, financial reporting is also a power user and, you know, specifically for financial related data. Um, there were links throughout the presentation and there's also some here um, about all of, most of them relate to Power BI because it's so new, although we do have one for how to extend uh, the, the out of the box SSRS reports. And um, oh, I, I was gonna mention that um, for financial reporting, the uh, what comes out of the box uses main accounts and main account categories. Um, and then of course it can be customized for uh, your specific dimensions. But of course those can't come out of the box because they vary based on the customer. And uh, like I said, the business intelligence stuff is a area where we're adding more and more. So there, there's the BI blog, the team's blog, um, where they announce things. And you'll see that the down below here, that was one of the first places that the uh, bring your own database, entity export to database was available. Now, of course, there is a help, help topic for it as well. Um, so that is the first half of the presentation. I haven't seen any questions yet, so I think I'm going to start on the document routing agent, and we can talk about, we can take questions on either at the end, of course. So, um, so our, we're going to talk about interactive printing, um, which is printing from the user printing from their from their computer sort of out of the box with no just the browser in their computer and and whatever printer they may have connected to that uh, their computer could be a local printer with a with a cable is one example it could also be a network printer um, but network printing um, that's more integrated is this network printing topic where they can push print in finance and operations and it comes out of the network printer um, the, the catch there is that without the document routing agent, you can't push print and have it come out on your printer that's on a cable or that does, or that you, if you don't have a document routing agent, we'll talk more about that. And then about the document routing agent in general, getting it configured and set up, so. So the scenarios for printing are that just printing what you see, you're used to in a browser, just doing control P and you know what's on the page comes out. That does not, um, that does not work in uh, finance and operations for uh, technical reasons. Um, I, I tried it last night just to, just to refresh, my, refresh myself and it was a big blank PDF that did not, did not work did not have anything in it. So, um, but getting the business documents and and uh, SSRS kinds of reports on paper is what we're talking about. And again, that's either interactive printing um, or network printing when you're printing from within finance and operations. So interactive printing, you don't really have to do anything, um, but what you, but what you do have to do, any printer that's connected to your to the client's computer is available. But what what you end up doing is 
downloading the report as a PDF. So it comes, it's right on the person on the user's computer. And then of course it's a file, PDF file, just like any PDF file, they can open it up, view it with their viewer, or they can print it to the, to any connected printer. Um, the good thing about this is that users will learn that printing it to the file and viewing it that way is faster to render. Um, if they print it to the screen and then print it to the file, not only is the screen a little slower, but you also have to render it twice, once to the, once to the screen and once to the PDF file. So once you have that PDF on your local computer, you know, you can do a lot with it and, and it's generally faster to get it there. The downside is that um, some of these files contain sensitive data and they are downloaded to the user's computer, which is the exact benefit. That's how you get the benefit. So there's some tension there and that's why we have other, other options. But for a lot of things, um, this is a good move. And I have to say that I was skeptical, um, but that it would, would be like an extra step and it, it technically is, I guess, an extra step, but it's pretty smooth, you know, with the browser asking you to open the file and stuff like that. And I guess if the user opens the file instead of saving it, then you the file gets cleaned up. Uh, so that's one option, but I'll sh I have some slides here that show the uh, progression. So you, you print a report just like anything. When the destination comes up, you set the destination to file. And then you pick your file format and then you click OK. And when it, after it renders, you get this dialog and, you know, you can, um, save it. I guess there is no open option on the file save. So on this, this example, this, this, I took these slides a little while ago, but they probably haven't changed. So I apologize for that. But anyway, you save the file and then when it's downloaded, you can open it and then you know what to do from there. Again, it's pretty smooth, um, but the files are on the computer. So then if that's, you know, so then there's network printing and obviously those computers are still connected to the, um, those printers are still connected to the user's printer, but in order to not have a file on the user's computer, um, what, ha what technically happens is because finance and operations is in the cloud and it's not a part of the customer's uh, network, the, uh, there's got to be some way for the two to communicate, even though they kind of don't really know about each other. And so the, the document routing agent sits in between and it, basically watches, it's connected to the printers, it runs on a computer that's, that is on the customer's network, and it has a connection, a login to the cloud where it uploads what you wanna print, or download, takes what you wanna print from the cloud and down and sends it to the printer. So it's sort of in between the two, which uh, these two, it's in between these two things that don't know about each other. Um, so that's why I said the document routing agent sits on a computer on the customer's network and has a connection in the cloud. And you'll see those things. Um, you install the document routing agent on that computer. You install the printers on that computer. Uh, the printers show up in the document routing agent. Um, but the start of it is from the network printers. then bug fixes with the platform. So uh, this is our plug to make sure you stay current on your platform. And when you, whenever you switch platforms, you should uninstall the old document routing agent and install the new one. And here's a picture of what it looks like. There's the document routing agent on the corporate network. It's got some connections to the um, Azure, the cloud where um, finance and operations is, and then there's the user connecting to finance and operations. And the user doesn't have to be connected to the corporate network, but it'll come out, the documents will come out 
on a printer on the network. So this is the document routing agent main window. Once you're, uh, you can see there's a sign out button, that which means you had to sign in, and that is where you it connects to the cloud. The settings is where you tell it you enter the URL of your environment that you're printing for. So uh, you can see that that's how it connects to the cloud, and we are, um, and is running on the network. So that's how it gets access to the printers. You'll see that when you're setting it up, the document routing agent has a list of local printers. You um, local to that com to the computer it's installed on. This was, uh, yeah. So you'll see all the printer all the printers technically, but of course the network ones are probably the most interesting. And we'll talk a little bit more later about why you would have some printers enabled on why you would have multiple document routing agents and why um, they would have not all printers enabled on all or how you decide which printers to enable on which document routing agents. Um, yep, once you have it set it up in the DRA and I think it takes three minutes for a new printer to show up they pull it every three minutes. The printer will show up in the network printers where you can enable it for each company. Just, yep. And then uh, let's see here. And then the user experience is that, is that, uh, kind of, it's that's the nice experience that we were looking for here where on the printer screen, in, in the finance and operations, the printers that are enabled show up in the list um, and you can obviously select the printer you want if there's more than one and then, and that's it, right? No file goes to your computer, it just goes out to the printer. So there's some considerations for the document routing agent. It's single threaded, so it can only process one print job at a time. That could result in delays um, if a, a single DRA is servicing multiple busy printers. Um, but we do have, uh, in the, we have some FAQ at the end here and uh, there have been some changes and improvements made in this area, which makes the need for um, having more, the need for having multiple DRAs is, is now less than it used to be as of, uh, also platform 12. Um, and a single host computer can only support one document routing agent. So if you need multiple document routing agents, you're going to need multiple computers. These are, you, know, you can use what, any computer you want, um, but it has to be running Windows 8.1. Oh, the, the prerequisites are later on. I'll, but it has to be running the right operating system. And, and the DRA can run as a Windows service, or it may have to be running on the desktop for precision documents like checks. Like checks. So um, uh, again, the short, answer, the short story is that each, you need one computer for each document routing agent, and they can be fairly light machines, like people use Azure or AWS machines. Um, but some of them also, it has to be running on the desktop for, for checks. And uh, I think the other um, precision thing is like barcodes. Yeah, so the host computer has to be running Windows 8.1 and, or, I mean, sorry, or Windows Server 2012 R2. Um, the printers have to be installed locally on that computer and must be installed by the same Windows account who that installed, uh, that, that either is running the service or that's logged in when their document routing agent is on the desktop. And th these are important things. That's why they're, uh, that's why they're here. Um, otherwise you'll get 
inconsistent or it won't work at all if the um, if the security is not not right that the same user installed the printers and is running the document routing agent either as a on the desktop or as a service and then the the account used to log into the document routing agent which is a finance and operations login it has to be a finance and operations login and it has to have the document routing client role Right, so for precision documents like checks that I talked about, the uh, how it do, how it does the exact pre precise documents is it actually uh, renders it as a PDF and prints that, and that's why it needs to be uh, why the doc Acrobat reader needs to be installed on that DRA machine, and why it has to be running on the desktop. It does not support. Um, running the DRA as a service for precision documents. And the reporting team does know that that's a, that's not, that's not the, that's not ideal because if the computer reboots or something, then somebody has to go and restart the, the DRA. Um, but uh, I'm sure that there is an idea out there on the idea site and that you should vote for it, but they're certainly aware of it and, um, I'm assuming they'll fix it. They'll change it if they can or when they can. Okay, so I, I guess I'll go through the uh, um, FAQ here, which are some um, questions that we've heard before, and then we can open it up to general questions. Looks like we have plenty of time. So are there capacity considerations? And prior to platform update 12, print jobs were were processed first in last out which on a busy document routing agent would mean that you, you know you could wait a long time uh, and you know it wasn't a, a good design but that's how it ended up and uh, but and eventually it was in platform 12 it was finally fixed it was a significant effort I was told I talked to the document routing agent people um, but and uh, the old solution we talked about was to use more document routing agents, but um, you know now that is less. We still recommend that you test your uh, printing scenarios on UAT to make sure that things are moving as expected. But with the uh, first in, first out processing, um, a document routing agent can handle um a quite a few print a quite a few printers one busy printer it might still be a good idea to have it on its own document routing agent because what well, well when it's um document when it's handling multiple printers it doesn't take it long to send the job it doesn't have to wait for the job to physically print it just has to spool it to the printer um, but when it's a busy printer it will en end up having to wait for um, jobs to print and that could block other printers that are less busy. And uh, there was a capacity consideration in the early platforms before platform five, where the number of printers and companies um, affected the time it took for the DRA to even check for a print job. So if you had 10 printers and 10 companies, that was that's 100 combinations and Checking all those combinations internally could take it 30 seconds, which would mean that a job could take 30 seconds to print, even if it was the only job. Uh, this was improved in Platform 5, and so most people are probably past it. Um, but it, it, it was a, you know, it was a, it could be a problem with, um, because it, it's not supposed to take 30 seconds for one, one, if you only print one thing and it takes 30 seconds, uh, that is not an ideal user experience. So um, I guess there's another reason to update your platform. Are there any extensions available? Um, yeah, there is a delegate where you can um, write a handler to 
put the printers in the list. And so what you would normally do is figure out some or have some uh, have a customization to note which printers should be used by which users. And then you can use this to consume that data and then only put the printers for the user that are applicable to a user in the list for that user. Um, and that's nice for if you've got like a check printer that you don't want certain people using or uh, or just in general, if you have a lot of printers, the, the customer who had the Platform 5 problem with the customers, I'm sorry, the large number of printers and large number of companies, obviously having a having like 50 printers in the list um, is not productive for users. And so they, they ended up writing a customization to filter the list because to, to be user specific so they could configure which, which users were applicable to which printers. And this is how they did it. Um, if you have a printer that is business critical or very busy, you can also register it on multiple document routing agent in case there it may be able to pick up a job when the um, uh, you know when the other document routing agents are busy to get things keep things moving faster and then um, I think I mentioned is there a de delay before a new printer can start printing and it's the list of printers in the cloud is refreshed every three minutes so there, there'll be a one-time delay of up to three minutes. You know, I guess if you're a statistics person, it'll on average be a minute and a half, but uh, it's a three minute, because that's not a frequent event, so it's not checked real often. Um, and we have some pretty good documentation on uh, the document routing agent um, in term, both the overall thing, overall information, installing it, and then running it as a Windows service. And that is everything on um, for the slides. I see there are a few questions in the Let's see here. Let's see. Uh, Craig had a question about on-premise deployments and you can no longer send a report to the screen. Is this true? Oh, wait, was this, oh, there was a response. I haven't heard that this is the case before. If I, if Eric doesn't know definitively, we will find out and that I do not know. So we'll have to find out. So we'll keep a, we'll capture a log of the, uh, um, we'll capture a log of the comments and we'll follow up on those. Um, Larry asked about sending reports to email and yes, there is, there is some, I believe there is information, a help topic on that. You may be able to search the, uh, help site by, for email. Um, but we can, we can find that link for you. Yes. Um, Daisuke asked about the document routing agent, platform update 12, support up to 50 network printers. Um, I think that before that, it, it, it really depended on how busy they were. Um, we did, we've had, I have a customer who has, that's, it's that same customer with the with the number of printers and the number of companies problem. And they have not not as many num questions as, or not as many printers as in this question, but um, they were using about, I think they have two or three document routing agents now. So, um, so I would say that, you know, it was probably a good 20 or so before, but Again, you, you really need to test and because it all depends on how frequently things come. And as long as you're past platform 12 and you don't have the company and printer problem, 
because with this with a large number of printers in the question um, that could have been a factor but if you're past platform 12 um, I think that you know I don't think that you have to have one document routing agent for every 25 printers depending on how many users uh, the, this customer that has all these printers, they are network printers um, and they don't want the files on their users' computers, but basically every user has their own printer. And so that was kind of the scenario. So they're not terribly busy. And so especially, you know, um, the platform 12 change would be, would be good. And we can, I can talk to the document routing agent team about this question and let let you know as well because it's a good question um one bill asked one flaw that i've seen when printing precision documents is the retention of the acrobat re reader settings fr from prior print jobs i if if a pdf is printed in landscape format was the last thing printed a check spooled afterwards will not print correctly i have heard of that um and i think that I will have to ask the document routing agent team on that one too. Um, I know that the the um, the versions of the PDF reader that you pay for have more capability with in terms of the settings, um, but I know that most people use the free one, so that is a uh, Martin is going to answer that one. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, so when you're doing precision printing scenarios, uh, as Eric was pointing out, it does use uh, the Acrobat PDF re reader to do the rendering. And by precision printing scenarios, we basically mean custom margins. So you typically see that on checks. Um, but basically the trick is to um, go to the document routing agent, uh, log in as the, uh, the document routing agent user, of course, run Acrobat reader, print something, anything, it doesn't really matter what the sample file is, and make sure you select actual size for the settings. And as long as you actually print it, then it should remember that as its previous setting. Um, there really shouldn't be anyone else using the document routing agent computer, so once you have that set to be actual size, then you shouldn't have any weird scaling problems where you end up with something like a, you know, a micro font on a check being scaled and then the bank doesn't like it anymore. Uh, so that would be our guidance there is, uh, you know, set it up. As Eric says, uh, if you were using the full Acrobat, you can actually uh, save the setting. But the Acrobat reader essentially remembers what the user last selected. And for precision printing scenarios, it's really always going to be actual size. Beyond that, any changes you make to fit it on a page or something like that should really be changes to your SSRS design, not to not using the scaling inside Acrobat because that'll just cause you other problems. Does actual size, um, the question also asked about um, portrait or landscape. That I have not uh, tried. Um, Okay. But, yeah, again, we can I, check I on think, that. I would, I would think you want to. You generally want to leave leave the settings on there alone once you have them established, and do whatever you need to do with the uh, with the SSRS design. Yep. And we'll. Uh, yep. That sounds good. And we'll we'll make a note to check on that as well. But that's should answer most of it. Um, does I don't see any other questions. So I think that we are done. I thank you very much for attending. We hope you found it useful. And um, again, the recording and the slide deck will be available. All right, thank you, Eric. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take a moment and bring your attention to a link that I just posted in the messages panel. That's a link to a short survey for this web conference. And we ask that you please take a moment before logging out to access it. We hope that you found today's information helpful, and if you enjoyed today's web conference or have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, this is your chance to let us know. The survey scores are on a scale from 1 to 5, with 5 being the highest score possible. And that is going to conclude today's web conference. As Eric mentioned, attendees may access the web conference recording by the same registration link used to attend today's live broadcast. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter, Eric, and thank you, audience, for logging in and joining us today.